So let's start computing some probabilities. First, the scale of measurement. Probabilities are conventionally measured between 0 and 1. That's 0% to 100%. It's a percent scale. And what do the extremes mean? Well, if something has probability 0, it cannot happen. It's not that it's just unlikely. It's that it is impossible, physically not possible. If an event has chance 1, then it is certain. It must happen. In the sorts of situations we're going to be in, that means physically it absolutely must happen, not just that it is very likely. Now the word probability is rather long and uh, we are lazy and so we will use some notation. Events, the things whose probabilities we are going to calculate, are usually denoted by letters that are early in the alphabet, A, B, C, and so on. Or sometimes they are used uh, in a way that shows what the event means. I'll come to that in a moment. But this notation is read as the probability that A happens. And even that is fairly long. So we say probability of A, chance of A. And when I write, I won't be terribly formal. I might write P, coin lands heads, the chance that the coin lands heads. And if I'm not feeling energetic, I might write simply P of heads. Or if I really want to move along, P of H, capital H, to remind me that it's heads. What is going on here should be clear from context. However, it is worthwhile to note that coin lands heads is clear when there is one coin being tossed once. But the minute you have more than one coin or more than one toss, then P heads, P H is not entirely nailed down. And it will be a good idea to read statements very carefully to learn exactly what's being talked about in the notation. I'll try to avoid notation as much as possible. But uh, some things are just faster to write down if you can use a little bit of math notation. All right, so what we're going to do with this? Well, we're going to do some calculations. And for that, I want a running example, which is the standard deck of cards. Every culture uses a deck of cards that looks pretty much the same, and every culture has its own names for it. I'll give you the names we're going to use. There are 52 cards in the deck. Uh, these 52 are 13 cards in each of four suits. The suits are these pictures, hearts, diamonds, spades, and clubs. Hearts and diamonds are red. Spades and clubs are black, so you have 26 red and 26 black. Now, within each suit, there are 13 ranks. There's the ace, then 2 through 10, jack, queen, and king. And the ace has just one of these symbols. It's the number one. Uh, and the jack, queen, and king are face cards. They have faces on them. This is typically something like a prince. That's a queen and uh, that's a king, and this usually has a moustache for some reason. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to start talking about conditions that cards satisfy, just to get used to looking at events. And so if we look at the cards that satisfy the condition ace and heart, well, how many cards are both aces and hearts? I think it's only one. I believe it's the ace of hearts. It's got to be a hearts. It's got to be one of these, and it's got to be an ace. Well, there's only one of them. So it's the ace of hearts. If you look instead at which cards satisfy the condition ace or heart, now it's a bigger set. I counted 16. How did I count 16? Well, hearts are fine. How many of them are there? There are 13. So there are 13 of these. But then I'm willing to accept a few more. I'm willing to accept the other aces as well. So there's the ace of diamonds, the ace of spades, the ace of clubs. Three more. That's 16 cards. And part of the reason for looking at this now is to note that when you ask for something that is an ace and a heart, you are being rather picky. You are not satisfied with just an ace. You are not satisfied with just a heart. You have to have both. 
and the minute you start putting more conditions on your event, I want this and that and that and that, the number of outcomes that satisfy your conditions gets smaller. You want cake and you want ice cream and you want a holiday in a tropical paradise. Well, you know what? You're just less likely to be satisfied. There's a life lesson there somewhere. Whereas if you're a nice, easygoing person who will accept a card that's an ace, you will accept a card that's a heart, either or, it doesn't matter. Then you've got lots of cards that are going for you. And indeed, if I were to accept an ace or a heart or a diamond, then not only would these 16 cards work, there would be another 12. It would be the 12 diamonds that are left because I've already used up the aces. So I'd have 28 cards that would satisfy my conditions. So when you look at events that are of the form this or that or the other thing, expect their chances to be in general bigger than the ingredients. And when you look at events that are this and that and that and the other thing, expect those overall chances to be smaller than the ingredients. So how much bigger, how much smaller, let's sort that out. Um, Here's some language that you're going to be seeing over and over again. One card is dealt from a well-shuffled deck. What does that mean? There is an assumption there, and the assumption is that all the 52 cards are equally likely to appear. That's well-shuffled. In terms of chances, each card has chance 1 in 52. Now, supposing I ask, I'm going to deal this one card. What is the chance that it's an ace or a king? Well, we now know how to do that. How many cards satisfy this condition? Ace or king? Well, I think those are the four aces, four kings. That's eight cards total. Nothing else satisfies this condition. How many cards do we have in all? We have 52. They're all equally likely. The chance is eight out of 52. It's just the proportion of cards that satisfy this condition. And that's almost by definition of uh, probabilities when, which are based on equally likely outcomes. You take, as your denominator, the number of all possible outcomes, and as the numerator, the number of outcomes that satisfy your conditions. And that's great. And we've already observed that this is the proportion of cards that are either aces or kings. And surely that can be calculated in a different way. You can calculate that as the proportion of aces plus the proportion of kings. Can we? Does it work out? Well, the proportion of aces is 4 and 52. The proportion of kings is 4 and 52. When you add up, you get 8 and 52. And I get to get a little green check mark, like you get in edX. That is the right answer. That's lovely, but I know some of you have noticed that this method is not going to work if instead that single card is to be an ace or a heart. If you want the chance that it is going to be an ace or a heart, well, how many cards satisfy this condition? We just worked that out. It was 16. There were the 13 hearts, and then there were three more aces. There was the ace of diamonds, the ace of spades, and the ace of clubs. 16 cards out of 52. We should get 16 out of 52 as the answer. But if we try the method that we used before, and we simply add the chance that it's an ace, to the chance that it's a heart, then we'll be adding 4 in 52 and 13 in 52, and we'll be getting 17 in 52, and that is too big. And why is it too big? That's right, it is too big because you have counted one card twice. You have counted the ace of hearts as an ace, and you have counted the ace of hearts as a heart. And you've made an error, and the error has a name. And the error is called double counting. This is exactly what you've done. You've counted the ace of hearts double. All right, so you messed up. But uh, one of the great things about understanding an error is that then you know how to fix it. So to calculate the chance of getting an ace or a heart, we'll do what we did to start out with. Add the chance that it's an ace to the chance that it's a heart, but then correct for the double counting, we will subtract 
once the ace of hearts. We've added it in here, we've added it in here, we take it out once, then it's left only once. And this should be the right answer. Is it? Well, let's see. The chance that the card is an ace is 4 in 52. The chance that it's a heart is 13 in 52. The chance that it's the ace of hearts is one card out of 52 cards. If you put all of that together, what have you got? You have got your green check mark, 16 and 52. Now you have to be careful to subtract off this overlap, the ace of hearts, exactly once. If you subtract it off both times, then you will lose it. You want it just once. That's what this method does. It has a name, it's called inclusion exclusion. You include the aces, you include the hearts, and then you fix the problem by excluding once the ace of hearts. And this is all fine looking at it in words and in uh, proportions like this. It's much more evident when you look at what's happening in a picture. And there's a kind of picture that I hope you are going to be drawing lots and lots of. And I have joined you in drawing it informally myself. These things you'll have seen somewhere, they're called Venn diagrams and all they are are blobs representing sets. So what's going on here is that this rectangle is my entire outcome space. That is all 52 cards. The green blob represents the four aces and the uh, blue blob represents the four kings. It is for our purposes important to think of this as a space of probabilities and probabilities work very much like areas. So I'm going to think of the area of the whole space as one, 100%. The area of this green blob is 4 and 52. The area of the blue blob is 4 and 52. Yeah, it's not to scale. And the event, the card is an ace or a king, is the total shaded area. And that's a clean 4 and 52 plus 4 and 52 because the two events are what is called mutually exclusive. These blobs do not overlap. The card cannot be both an ace and a king. The sets are disjoint. In fact, your textbook calls the events disjoint. When you look at the card being an ace or a heart, you play the same game, then there's your blob representing the aces, and now you have a much bigger blob representing hearts, and there is an overlap. And that overlap is precisely the ace of hearts. So here, if you want the total shaded area, and you add this 4 in 52 to this 13 in 52, then you're almost right, but you have counted this overlap twice, and that is why we left it out once. And so many people find this method of looking at probabilities very helpful, and I encourage you to draw these pictures if you find them helpful. And so what do we have now as our rule? Well, we can write them out formally. We're trying to find the chance that A or B occurs. We have two events, A, B, and we're trying to find the chance of A or B. That's very formal. What does that mean in plain English? It means that at least one of them must happen. They may both happen, that's fine. At least one of them must happen. So if you draw the blobs corresponding to both, then you're looking at the entire shaded area of those two blobs. And what do we have? We have f formally the addition rule, which is that if your two events are mutually exclusive, in other words, the blobs corresponding to them don't overlap, then you can find the chance that at least one of them occurs by simply adding up the two chances. And mutually exclusive, in plain English, each event prevents the other. If one of them happens, the other cannot. And what if it isn't as clean a break as all that? Well then fine, 
then you want to find the chance that at least one of the events occurs. You go ahead and you do your plus, but then you fix your error by subtracting off the overlap. You subtract off the event that is A and B both happening. And I'm going to leave it at this for now and quickly mention another rule which is the most natural of the probability rules. If an event has chance 40%, then what's the chance that it doesn't happen? Yep, 60%. It's a natural rule and it says the chance of not A, the chance that A doesn't happen, is 1 minus the chance of A. It's called the complement rule. Please notice the E, complement, as opposed to complement with an I. That is, you know, you're looking gorgeous tonight. That's complement with an I. This is complement. This is the set theory complement. And what does that mean? It means all the outcomes that are not in your set. So the complement of A is the set of all outcomes that aren't in A. It is the event, not A. A doesn't happen. And the complement rule is something that we use naturally without even thinking about it. I'm just writing it down for completeness. And in fact, why don't we summarize our rules, all of which are quite natural, though perhaps the middle one uh, needed a little observation. If two events prevent each other, then the chance that at least one of them occurs is the sum of their chances. If they don't prevent each other, then you can correct. And here you have your complement rule. So what? You know me well enough if you've taken STAT 2.1 uh, to know that this is not where we're going to end. But for now, I am going to stop here because there is one other little rule that we need to develop. And once we've developed that one, then the combination of all these little rules turns out to be incredibly powerful. And so bear with me until we're through with the next section, and then we will see what we can calculate.